So, all right. Um, I'm going to talk about the future, and the great thing about talking about the future is that nobody knows if it's right, so nobody can argue. Ha. Um, if everything I say about what's going to happen in 25 years is wrong, anyone can come up to me and point it out, and I will buy you a beer. So I promise. Um, but first, I want to talk about um, where does learning start? All of us. It doesn't matter who you are. Learning starts with the ability to imagine what isn't, but what might be. I mean, this is kind of one of our human superpowers. So when, this is, for me, where virtual reality started. When I was six years old, I used to play with little plastic dinosaurs. My brother Mark, we would be down in the basement and we would make up endless stories with these things. And this idea of storytelling and creating stories and responding to what might be, I think is really the key to um, people starting to envision what might happen. I mean, how many people read Harold and the Purple Crayon, right? And, and I just like, for me, it was a documentary. And, <laughs> I just loved everything about it. I got a little older, and I went and I saw Fantasia, and, and they had even better dinosaurs. And, and I just completely got into this idea of possible worlds. And then I grew up, sort of, and I worked on Tron, and I was happy because I was contributing, but I was unhappy because this was all very nerdy and all the software used for Tron was based on computer-aided design, computer manufacturing software, and you could tell the aesthetic is very machine-like. So then I started trying to develop techniques that would take us out of this machine world and bring us back to the magical world of Fantasia, Harold and the Purple Crayon, and my little plastic dinosaurs. So I started developing procedural textures so that artists could start doing whatever they wanted. Um, and then those techniques um, started catching on, and yay, they started putting my work in dinosaur movies, which was a big win. This was Jurassic World and in, you know, and Harry Potter movies. Um, but at that point, I, I, was, I was okay with this, but I felt that something's missing. And then in 2006, I read Werner Vinge's Rainbow's End. How many people read Rainbow's End? That's your assignment, is you have to read that book. Uh, 25 years in the future, and everybody's wearing the contact lenses. And you put them in, and you can see whatever the heck you want, and that's the way. It's not about people who are walking around saying, wow, I can see whatever I want. It's about people for whom this is normal, just the way the cell phone for you now is normal. It's not Captain Kirk's communicator from 52 years ago anymore. So, so this notion of the future being normal, but with superpowers, is very exciting for me. So I didn't want to just anymore see Hogwarts. I wanted to be in Hogwarts. And I started thinking, how could we steer our research to help make that happen? Um, and so at some point, um, you know, um, technology advances, and there's going to be something that's going to look like um, the glasses. Whatever they'll look like, maybe this looks like it's an outtake from Tron, but maybe someone else will have better industrial design. And the idea is you'll just, it'll be just like, if you don't look to your left or your right right now, you probably don't remember who is wearing glasses. Glasses are successful technology because they become socially invisible. And once you have a socially invisible technology, it's no longer technology, it's just reality. We don't think of clothing as technology, although of course it is a technology, but it is such a ubiquitous technology that it is actually illegal not to have it. And, <laughs> and so this idea of just seeing objects that are out in the world, even though they're actually being projected into our own eyes, and accepting that they're part of reality will come to seem normal. And then things get interesting once these things become normal. Um, and so I kind of, I just sort of embrace the idea that at some point, I'll just be able to take my finger and I'll be able to start drawing in the air, you know, right anywhere and draw something that I want. And the fact that I drew it means it will come to life and it will become a creature that I can interact with. Um, and why shouldn't this be part of my reality? We're going to start having all the pieces and the wearables. And effectively, children will grow up in a world where they will just accept that it's basically Harry Potter meets Harold and the Purple Crayon. Except for them, it'll just be normal. And if we take that as our starting point and we say, what can we do with that to make the world a better, more interesting place? Well, let's talk about the fundamentals. What doesn't change with technology? So this is a scene that could have happened uh, 30,000 years 
years ago, humans have evolved to be social creatures. We have language, we have bodies, we have eyes and faces. We want to hang out with other humans, and we want to hang out with other humans ideally in the same physical world. Um, we go to museums, we go to restaurants, we go to parks. We find ways to be around other humans. And I think anything we do kind of has to sort of be predicated on the fundamental need we have is to, as you know, as Ian Forster says, only, only connect. So at some point, people will not be thinking about the glasses anymore. They'll be thinking about the person they're talking to and how do we serve their needs. So we call our lab now the Future Reality Lab, not the um, virtual reality lab or the mixed reality lab or whatever buzzword people use because we want to figure out how do we understand what the future normal will be when it is so accepted that it is no longer technology. Um, now, movies did not start as a social media. The 1892 Kinetoscope, Edison was very proud of this, didn't really catch on very much, mostly because you could not experience what the person next to you was experiencing. You were each having your own individual experience. Sounds familiar, right? This is where VR is now. Um, we all have had the experience of we're all standing around and someone's going, whoa, that's so cool, the colors, and we're just like waiting for our turn. And so this is not the medium of the future. Movies became exciting at the point where people could hang out together. And it wasn't just the technology of the projector, it was the idea of the sociology of the projector of you knew for sure that that warm body sitting next to you, that person who was your friend or your significant other, you could experience things at the same moment. They would laugh, they would gasp, you knew what was going on with them, you had your theory of mind with them. In fact, in some sense, what was going on with them was more important than what was going on with the, with the movie screen because part of the reason you go to the movie is to learn about the people you're with. So this guy, name this guy, anybody? Can anybody name this guy? One person can name this guy? 1965, he made a prediction. Gordon Moore, thank you, yes. Gordon Moore came with Moore's Law, which was that every 18 months or so, things would double. Um, and so far, it's been pretty true. Um, which is pretty amazing considering that this was over half a century ago. Computers are getting exponentially faster. The game keeps changing um, in a way that I don't think is matched by any other field. And, um, but this also has consequences because physics doesn't change. Be nice if it did, maybe, but it doesn't. So this honking big PC that's plugged into your wall outlet that has a GeForce NVIDIA card draws 300 watts for that card. Anything you put on your face in the future, just because of physics, is going to be like that little Snapdragon accelerator that's in, your, um, that's in your phone now. It's going to draw maybe three watts. A factor of 100 in computational power, when you work it out over doubling 18 months, comes out almost exactly to 10 years. Which means, if you just try to put something on your face, it, you're going to be 10 years in the past compared with what's running on your high-end PC. Nothing you can do about it. It's physics, because that's how much power you have. And that means that, and that's not just for graphics, that's also for sensing, for machine learning, for vision, for all this stuff that tells your wearable where you are, if that's your friend, if that's your hand in front of you. Um, which means that any research into how are we going to do this has got to deal with what I think of as a, as a, as a uh, not just edge computing, but double edge computing. There is that honking big PC plugged into the wall that's communicating by wire to the giant server farm that is essentially unlimited resources. Like, you know, when you do speech to text translate, you're making use of that that connection all the time, but then there's the edge device you wear, which has to keep talking to the inner edge, and that's where you're going to get your superpower. So this stuff is hard, but it also makes it interesting. Um, so um, we decided we would simulate this. We started in the fall of 2014. Um, we bought a whole bunch of Gear VRs, which are only 360. We put OptiTrack markers on them. In fact, the first time I looked into a Gear VR in September 2014, my friend Mike Wood said, here, check this out. And my first thought was, I have to buy a motion capture stage. So I went and I bought a motion capture stage, because you know, when you're research lab, you can do that. And then we had room scale, and we could have multiple people running around together. And 
they're all just running little Android phones, essentially, with Snapdragon processors. This isn't fancy computer graphics, but they can all see each other in real time. Everybody's position orientation is being transmitted to everybody else by Wi-Fi, and you're basically all in the holodeck together. And then we said, great, now that we're all transported into an alternate world, let's start figuring out what are different kinds of human interactions between people. We celebrated the, uh, the Mexican Day of the Dead um, on, on November 1st, 2015. Is the artist who made this work is uh, David Lobser, a brilliant um, VR artist. And then we have these entire teams that just said, suppose we're all spirits in the spirit world on the Day of the Dead, let's all just hang out. We like to think that this influenced Coco, but it probably didn't. Although we were a lot earlier. So they all see each other and they're all interacting socially. We had all kinds of, we had young people, old people, every age, people would play virtual musical instruments, interact with virtual animals, and they're all really just in this mocap stage, but they feel as they've been transported into this completely different world. He also picked the music. So this interesting question of what do you do when you have a bunch of people hanging out together, I actually want to, in the interest of time, cut this short and show you some other pieces. Um, David and I decided what happens if we go completely minimal, and so we only do head tracking. So you have this beautiful piece that he had hundreds of people go through, where it's very meditative, where everybody is a bird in a flock of birds. And we showed this um, in the 2016, I think, 2017 um, Feature Storytelling Festival. And we also strapped on wings. So everybody had these wings while in this virtual world. And um, the wings actually didn't do anything, but people really liked them. And they would flap them and they would make bird sounds and they would run around and, and just be in this, this, what's felt to them like this vast space. And what's interesting about this to me is that is that this was very meditative and people wanted to go back in it and it was very calming and, and, and it became this kind of refuge for people. But then we took pretty much the same experience and all we did was change the audience. So I'm gonna now show you what happens if we did the same thing, but we did this with, um, with 10 year old girls. So same exact experience, but a group of 10 year old girls. And this is how they received the same ex the Girl Scout troop that came to our lab. I always cut short the other videos, but I can't bring myself to cut this one short because it's just like so amazing. Um, so it gives you a sense of some of the different projects that we've done. Um, and, um, and we did a whole bunch of projects and each one was like learning about something else. Um, last October we showed, uh, we did a scene from, uh, inspired by Alice in Wonderland. It was a collaboration with, uh, with Clara Fernandez who, uh, who um, also spoke here, um, and, and a bunch of people, and we basically said, okay, we're gonna put actors and the, um, the audience all in the same physical room, except everybody is in this magical realist alternate reality, and that let us do things like make people really artificially giant or tiny, or do make magic transformations happen right out of Lewis Carroll. Um, and we learned two things from that. One thing we learned was that it's really, really fun to take people on, on this journey, but we also learned as the great, um, as the great playwright John Patrick Shanley once said when asked about um, what he loved about the theater, he said, the beautiful thing about the theater is that there's no money in it. <laughs> and so we realized that this was wonderful, but it only had a limited ability to impact the larger culture. So we shifted gears in our lab and he said, suppose instead of doing something that you needed live actors, suppose we said, our goal is to scale. We want to 
have the kind of vast scale that a feature film would have where it could eventually reach hundreds of millions of people, which means it can't actually be live performance, but we actually want to keep some of the qualities of live performance um, that VR could allow us to have. So, so the question was, you know, so we actually asked ourselves these analogies, like silence or to talkies as VR is to what? Let, let's talk about silent movies. So if you went up to the richest filmmakers in Hollywood in 1925, you know, the four mavericks, um, Mary Pickford, um, Cecil B. DeMille, um, Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and you said to them, hey, you know, everything you're doing now, you're rolling in the dough, but in two years, you're going to have to throw it all out. They would have laughed you out of their studio, but in fact, Two years later, 1927, this movie came out. Can anyone name this movie? There you go. And it required this huge, it was not a smooth production. It required a huge team of technical people. This whole Vitaphone equipment was really difficult to operate and someone had to be like standing over it all the time. And except they showed that people loved this. And so by 1929, the production practices had streamlined and for all practical purposes, movies had switched over to talkies. So it required people to do an experimental intervention. So we're trying to do experimental experimental interventions to see if we can do a little culture hacking to kind of move things forward. Um, so we're thinking about the, the, the basic idea is movies on that holodeck. Imagine you're in a Star Wars movie, but you're sitting there and all the stuff is happening all around you. Um, or, you know, there's the Imperial walkers and they can step right over you. This is art by our resident artist, Chris Lang. Um, and um, and you're just you're just in the world. How would that be different from that rectangle that separates you from things? So um, we decided in order to uh, figure this out, we went to the source, the 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 origin of VR, which of course are cave paintings, because that was the first virtual reality. And we decided to make a story about cave painting. Um, where basically the audience is completely transported because everybody is wearing room scale untethered headsets. We're using Lenovo Mirage Solos. They're awesome. Um, and they, um, again, they're just Snapdragon and Android, but they let you freely move your head and have six degree of freedom room scale and no wires. Um, and we network them together so audience members can see each other as avatars. And there's this whole story involving um, ancient shamans and an actual woolly mammoth, well, a virtual actual woolly mammoth, walks through. And our goal here is if anybody is going to SIGGRAPH in um, August in Vancouver, Canada, we're going to be showing this for five days and to several dozen people at a time. And in the course of those five days, we're going to be showing this to about 3,500 people. Um, for those of you who can't make it, maybe we could give you a showing in our lab at some point, because that's right here across the street. Um, at 65th Avenue. Um, so talk to me if you if you actually if you're not going to Vancouver and you want to see this. But um, I actually want to then talk about one more topic, which is what what is communication? What you know? What's the human superpower? Humans have a superpower, and we have no other superpower. Um, and our superpower is we have this instinct to be able to learn and evolve language. This building that you're in, this entire city, everything is basically because of the power of language. We get together, we plan things, we do things, we come up with imagine things that can't exist and we can communicate with each other. I say the word elephant, the word elephant is in your head, that's mind reading. It's so normal to you that you don't think about it, but it's an incredible superpower. So I feel as though what's really going to be exciting is going to be anything that does, you know, these kids, what do they want to do? All they want to do is talk to each other. So anything that evolves language is going to be like the big deal. So let's take for granted, it'll just be glasses, maybe eventually contact lenses. We won't think about it. Forget the technology. The technology is going to happen. Moore's law is amazing. Gordon Moore was right in 1965, and it looks like he's going to continue to be right. So people are hanging out, and they're not thinking about the technology. They're just thinking of themselves as socially interacting with each other. What are we all going to do about it? Well, my vision for this is that the dystopian future, which you've probably seen in various videos, is we're wearing these wearables and there's menus floating in front of us and we pick from the menus and it's like, oh, I'm going to shop here and I'm going to buy this and I'm going to do this movie. That's horrible because that takes our attention away from each other. I feel like the positive future is going to be one in which we evolve language so that we're talking to each other 
but it, the speech also happens, the speech act also happens in the visual field. So I want to be able to do, say things like, you know, I just want to interact with a character. Why shouldn't I just draw this character in the air in front of me? And the fact that I drew this character in the air means it comes to life, it knows about me, it's in, this character is interested in me because, actually my cursor, because, because it's actually ticklish. And, and why shouldn't I be able to say, hey, I'm interested in these procedural textures, and I want to teach somebody about procedural textures. Why shouldn't I just be able to invoke procedural textures and just bring them up and talk about them and you know, talk about you know, the software that, that, that creates them and then be able to edit that you know, while I'm teaching somebody about my, my subject, for example, which is graphics and, and texturing. Um, why shouldn't I be able to say, um, I want to describe some, I don't know, I want to talk about a journey or something. So I, as I'm talking about a journey, I should be able to visualize it with illustrations. And those illustrations should be active parts of what I'm talking about. Um, and why shouldn't we also have this notion that between us, the things that float between us are part of a shared design language. Things that now you would think of as, oh, well, I have to go off into a room somewhere and spend a lot of time designing that. Why shouldn't that be part of our speech act? Suppose you and I, you know, we're, we're looking around and we say, hey, you know, it would be nice to have some flowers here. Um, let's just um, draw in the air between us and, and, and just, I want to draw a vase, you know, whatever is a vase shape. There's my vase shape. All right, and so I just drew that vase shape. And if I, if I had AR and I could track my fingers and I had little cameras, which is only a few years away, that could just be very simple. The equivalent of the leap motion technology together with any of these AR glasses that are coming out. And we say, oh, I want this to be a particular material. And meanwhile, my 3D printer is gonna print that. But meanwhile, you might say, wait a second. Hey, Ken, I don't like the shape of your vase, but you know the same language. So you go ahead and you do your speech act and you say, I want to actually talk about how I want this vase to be. And you start drawing in the air various kinds of curves and you start creating the shape of your vase. And by the way, everything I'm doing here is, everything I've been doing is live software. It's not the software that's the problem. We can develop the software. It's then the idea of the sociology of putting it between us. And because it's a speech act, we can bounce back and forth. I might say, hey, I really like that shape you drew. But you know, that shape you do, that nice little spline, I'm not gonna use that for a vase. I wanna use that for my little animated character that I've been working on. I've been working on a little animated fish, and what you've just done is you've created a really nice path for my fish. So we're gonna take this, and like you can always take nouns and verbs in language, we've now changed the noun to keep the same verb. So this is uh, you know, a three-dimensional path for a fish floating in space between us. You know, it's actually some sort of augmented reality that floats between us. And and you and I are both sharing this reality together, but we're creating together. Um, I'm gonna show you a little video that I made last summer um, that sort of puts some of these ideas together. Now, just so you know how I made this video, I took a light pen, it looked pretty much like this, except that a little light, um, and, and then I used this computer, this cool computer with the picture of the dinosaurs on it, and, um, and I used that little camera, and I just wrote some software and I just drew in the air, and I, because I couldn't click on this thing, I used the keyboard to click. But this is just real time. So the problem isn't the software. The problem is just moving over to the point where we're in this sort of positive face-to-face -face communication between us. So I'm gonna show you my little, my little visualization of the future, which was just my little demo of like where I think would be a, a kind of a fun, positive way for us. And this, this is taking examples from my, comp my graduate computer graphics class. So if you've never seen matrices before, you should pay attention because you might learn something. So, okay. Um, if I want to teach you a concept from physics, such as the movement of a pendulum, I should just be able to draw the pendulum in the air between us. I should also be able to draw a graph which shows what happens when I apply an impetus to the bob of the pendulum, and then you can see the roughly soon soil wave which ensues as a result. If I want to teach you about an animated character, I should be able to draw a very fat character, or I should be able to draw the same character as very skinny. And you should be able to see, based on this, how the character movement is affected by its shape. If I want to teach you about three-dimensional rotation, I should be able to draw an object and apply various properties to that object, for example, color, 
and then drop that object into a coordinate system, which could either be a two-dimensional coordinate system or it could be a three-dimensional coordinate system. If we drop the object into the coordinate system, you can see that any changes to the object itself are reflected in the view of the object in the coordinate system. To do something a little more sophisticated, we need more sophisticated tools, for example, a 4x4 matrix, which can be used to affect translation or rotation. Now this is just a symbolic matrix, but if instead I make a numeric matrix by, for example, attaching a slider to it, then I should be able to change numeric values in ranges, in this case from 0 to 1 radian, or in this case from 0 to 10 radians. Applying this matrix to the relationship between the polygon and the coordinate system, I should be able to now see how by interposing the matrix, I'm able to change the rotation about, for example, the x-axis or perhaps the y-axis. Notice that this is a slightly different matrix. Or I should be able to add time as a quality in this relationship by dragging time between the slider and the matrix itself. Now this becomes a rate controller. And I can, for example, rotate more quickly about the y-axis, or I could alternatively rotate about the z-axis. Now everything I'm doing is actually three-dimensional. You can see that I'm actually rotating in three dimensions, and this is actually a scene that's floating in space between you and me. Now let's um, talk about dimensions. We can have three-dimensional objects, but we could also have four-dimensional objects. Here, for example, is a hypercube. Now, a hypercube, when projected down to three dimensions, appears to be the same as a cube, but if we rotate it about the right axis, we can see it's actually a four-dimensional object that can appear through augmented reality to be floating in the air between us. Thank you. Okay. So... I love that video, it's so much fun. I was in Trinity College and I, in Dublin and I was just sitting in this hotel room and I said, I know I'm gonna make a video. And I just did. Um, so um, uh, so, so to, to wrap up, um, I think that the most important thing here is not technology because as Alan K. once said, technology is whatever was invented after you were born. Um, it's not, techno we're always living in the future. I mean, we've got these airplanes and these smartphones and these telephones and these movies and the internet, and we don't think about them because they're just normal. So whatever this is gonna be, it's just gonna be normal. The, 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 the interesting thing is what we do with them. Will we use it to create divisive things that split us apart and make us, um, you know, um, artificially stupid? Um, or are we going to use it to be able to enhance our ability to communicate with each other and recognize each other and really understand what each other is talking about as opposed to talking past each other? And I feel that the answer to that is not going to lie in technology. It's going to lie in what we choose to do with it. The ethical issues, the communication issues, the social issues, uh, these are not going to be handed to us by any advances in Moore's Law. These are things we have to work out. And I just wanted to leave you by saying, I work with a really amazing group of people. The Future Reality Lab is like incredibly hardworking and exciting and brilliant young people who are real idealists. And um, we've instituted a daily blog. Um, and so every day, somebody in our lab writes, in fact, I'm just gonna like uh, do this. Um, um, frl.nyu.edu. Every day somebody writes another, um, another post on the blog, and I encourage you to read them because these people are just incredibly brilliant. Um, and, and, and each one talks about a different aspect of what excites them about working on this stuff. And it's like, I spend a lot of time every day just reading about what my students are doing, and I'm constantly delighted and surprised by it. And uh, so that's just a little plug for our amazing students and our amazing lab. And I would like very much to thank this amazing conference, which is probably one of the most important conferences in the world, for inviting me and inviting all of us and allowing us to have this time together. Thank you very much.